Has anybody ever had a um, care of a child that was too small to ever take your eyes off of them and you're the only adult so you have to bring them into the bathroom with you? <laughs> yeah. That was the case with Joanne who had her little daughter Gracie, her toddler, to take care of and so she needed to take a shower. So, you know, you got to be creative, right? <laughs> so she brought in a toy or something to engage Gracie while she popped in the shower as fast as she could. And maybe she took longer than she thought, but when she was really surprised when she opened the shower curtain and what she had standing there was not her little daughter, Gracie, but a little mummy who was completely wrapped in toilet paper, <laughs> not even a hair sticking out, you know, just, just there. And Joanne was, you know, just overtaken with the joy of the moment and how funny it was. So she went and ran and got her camera and took a picture, and she just loved this so much, and thought it was so funny, and wanted to bring this kind of joy to everybody she knew. So she made it her Christmas card, and she sent it out to everyone, you know? And this year, it was, it was so great that she added people to her Christmas card list. So she's talking to a friend of hers after the Christmas cards have been sent out, and her friend said, and she says, wasn't that hilarious? I couldn't believe Gracie did that, and I just had to catch that moment. And her friend said, oh my gosh, it was so funny. She goes, but Joanne, did you notice what was in the right-hand corner? And Joanne looks at the card again. And there's Joanne, all of Joanne. <laughs> When you open up the card to see the inscription, it says, Joy to the world revealed this day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we dream about these things. We don't usually have them happen in reality, right? <laughs> but you know, the real lost moment of this would have been if Joanne couldn't have laughed at herself. Right? If she couldn't have just gone ahead and laughed at the situation. Because what are you going to do? It already happened, right? <laughs> so if we could bring that kind of gentleness and generosity to ourselves and to each other and just say, oops, <laughs> I made a mistake. That wasn't my intention to do that. But, you know, let's just laugh about it and break up that energy and move forward. That's joy. That's what children do. You know, they make a mistake, and then there's a moment of whatever happens out of that mistake, and then a minute later, they're laughing and, and playing. You know, do you ever notice that? That's our, if we look to children, we see our natural state and how we are these emotional beings that we can, we can move through things pretty quickly and move back to that natural place that is our joy because it's always there and it is the very essence of who we are joy isn't something like that happens because things went our way and now we feel joyful i mean that's sort of like a relative understanding of happiness right joy is an, an ongoing constant that is available to us you know so no matter what's going on in our lives it's the taproot of of the essence of us it's the taproot of the christ the divine in us and so it's there and available to be tapped, even in the midst of difficult times, even in the midst of grief, you know? Because you know that what grief is, is an expression of love. That's all it is. So if you are in grief and you're either trying to push it away or not really you know, wanting to experience it, if you can remember, oh, wow, what this is, is an expression of my love for someone or something that I miss or that I feel sad about their presence or whatever the case may be in, the, in that case. So to know that you are also tapping one of these essence 
you know, steps along the way in Advent, this preparation to Christmas, which is the breakthrough of the Christ consciousness, right? This is the rebirth of the Christ consciousness. And so along the way in, in Advent, we, we make a stop at faith. We begin our Advent season with faith, grounding in that foundation of a sense of, of that knowing that we have in our heart of a presence that is in us and all around us, that is us individualized, and that is that greatness, that allness, that is available to us. And then we journey with that kind of grounding into peace, into the peace that is the sense of that the season, right? That, that sense of, oh, yeah, there are those moments, even in a busy season. Don't you have those moments when you notice the light or you notice some interaction that just puts a smile on your face that, you know, they all kind of weave together. So there is joy in the peace and love in the joy and so on. And then love. Last week we stopped along the way at love and to feel that love and that connection for each other, but also that connection that is within us with spirit. And finally now, it's, this is the children's Sunday, really. So this is the day that the, you know, we all become like little children, right? This is part of what, what Jesus, of course, offered to us. How do you enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, become like a little child again. It helps, I have to admit, I use it as a crutch, to have children around us. And because I have uh, Grace, our goddaughter, five-year-old, living with us, I get that, that shot of joy pretty regularly, you know, with, with her joy and reflected back. And then the little kids in us come out. So we've been doing Elf on the Shelf. Anybody know about Elf on the Shelf? Yeah, a few of you do. So Elf on the Shelf is a fairly new thing. I, I don't know how many years it's been around. New to me last year. What happens is the Elf on the Shelf book arrives with a little elf, the skinny little elf. And the idea is that the elf, the child names the elf, and then you, uh, that, that the, the elf puts herself or himself somewhere in the home each day. Be, and then they watch the child. And then they fly back to the North Pole in the night and let Santa know how things are going for the child. <laughs> And then they arrive in a new place in your home in the morning. So Jingle, our elf, has been all over the place in all the craziest places. I mean, she's been riding toy horses. She's been in the company of stuffed animals. Today, she's riding a branch in the Christmas tree. You know, she's just, she hangs from the lights. She does all kinds of crazy things. But what's priceless about this is every morning is like Christmas morning. So Grace, as soon as she opens her eyes, wants to know where Jingle is, and she runs out of bed and goes, finds Jingle. And then as soon as we get up, you know, each of us open our eyes, come on, come on, come on. She'll grab my hand and you know, drag me into wherever place. Look, look, look where Jingle is. Sometimes she'll do that throughout the day. I'm like, you remember you showed me this morning, but you know, it's okay. It's okay, you can have joy at noon and joy in the evening too, you know? <laughs> So, you know, we can do these kinds of things for ourselves. We don't have to only be in the company of children because we're a bunch of kids anyway, right? And this is the, the, the beauty of Christmas. It's like the whole thing is about the, the unwrapping of the gifts of us, the unwrappings of the gifts of humanity, the unwrapping of the gifts that spirit have given, has given to us. And if we can approach things in that way and stop ourselves when we get lost in the shuffle of stress and all that stuff that often happens for people in the holidays and just go, oh, wait, I'm going to bring a smile to my heart right now. I'm going to take one breath and imagine that there's a smile in my heart right now. And then I'll reopen my eyes and look out into the world and see from that place. So it can be that kind of, joy doesn't always have to be sort of raucous. It can be this sort of quiet kind of peaceful joy, a kind of knowing, right, that all is well, that life is good, that there's so much to be grateful for. We have these bodies, and we have a breath, and we have a pulse, and we have an opportunity to live and to serve and to experience and to grow. There's so much good, right? to be here. And so it's a kind of seeing through the, the eyes of goodness, the eyes of appreciation. And laughter, boy, laughter is really a key to this, isn't it? A key expression of when we feel joyful. Anybody ever laugh till you cry, till your <laughs> guts hurt? I mean, isn't that the best? You know, it's been a while since I've laughed that hard, but I'm awaiting the opportunity. <laughs> 
And that, that, that feeling of just complete, like, giving over, letting go, and being, we are so in the present moment when we laugh. Anybody ever be, like, laughing hilariously and thinking about what you've got to do at the same time? <laughs> no, because we are so given over to the presence of joy. And so it's those moments that remind us, really in truth, who we are and to take things a little bit lighter, you know, to lighten up a little bit. <laughs> and if we can even just use that as kind of a mantra for ourselves during this season, I am going to lighten up, feel the smile on my heart, and approach this moment as a child would Christmas morning. <laughs> we could take that every, into every day of the year, couldn't we? <laughs> You know, there's a Yiddish proverb, and it says, laughter is to, uh, it says, what soap is to the body, laughter is to the soul. Amen. Yeah, and there's a Japanese proverb that says, time spent laughing is time spent with the gods. Amen. Isn't that true? There is that sense of godliness, of goodliness when we're in those moments. And then Norman Cousins said that laughter is inner jogging. <laughs> uh, we've actually heard that, you've probably heard that before, that it's like really good for your organs. It sort of like jostles everything around and sort of turns things into that sort of place of uplift. And I don't know if you know that he, he wouldn't say he's an expert, but a student right here in our midst of laughter yoga. And so I've invited David Peterson to take us through a little laughter yoga this morning. <laughs> I'm going to go through some breathing, laughing exercises with all of you. First of all, if everybody wants to stand up, please do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can do this to anybody on a cruise ship, walking on a street. Do it with me. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Ho, ho, ha, ha, ha. Okay, or do this. Very good, very good. Yay! People will look you in the eye and go, oh my God, you know laughter yoga. <laughs> Um, want to do, like I said, some ac exercises. I'm going to do an aloha exercise. So everybody who can bend down, do it with me. Gently, don't hurt yourself. And go, aloha. <laughs> Silly, I know, but that's, it's supposed to be. Let's do it again. Aloha. <laughs> this is a new one that was discovered by... I just saw it online or whatever. Okay, pretend we've got some mental floss here. Go into the ear. It's kind of funny. Ooh! Ah. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, much better. <laughs> we all know how to go into our hearts. I know we all do. So let's go into your heart, everybody, and just start off with a little giggle. <laughs> and that's laughter yoga, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Can you do the very good again? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> very good. Very good. Sorry, I should have done the clapping. In between the exercises, you go, ho, ho, ha, ha, ho, ho, ha, ha, Seriously, do that to anybody from another country. They may know. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. He, uh, David shared that at the winter solstice celebration on Friday night, if you were here, and I said to him, is there any way you could bring this to our Joy Sunday? So I really appreciate you. Yeah. And so these are exercises that, you know, you don't need to do them perfectly, right? It's just fun. It's just joyful. So I love the very good, very good. Yay. I'm going to start doing that a lot more. So this is one of the keys, obviously, to bringing forth our joy, is laughter. So find the things that make you laugh and, and, and look at the things that maybe didn't used to make you laugh and make a little bit lighter of them and let that laughter kind of break up the difficulties of the world. 
because that's what it does, right? It doesn't only open up our bodies and do something wonderful for us, but it gives the gift of joy to the world. It sort of has that ripple effect, doesn't it? Because we all love to laugh. Who doesn't love to laugh? Who have you ever said, oh, that person is just too funny, I don't want to be around them? <laughs> <laughs> so there is, a, there is a, an easy, an openness, a, a welcoming of laughter and joy. And then there's also that being present. You know, when we are really present to what is and what is available to us, we can find joy in just about anything. My friend Darlene, who's a, my prayer partner, her niece, uh, when she was four, her name was Mallory, uh, was seeing Santa, the typical visit to Santa, right? And her older brother Gavin was there and her mom, Shelly, and it was a pretty typical scene. You know how Santa often brings some of, some of the toys that you know, are displayed around Santa's feet when he's greeting the children. And so Mallory was sitting in Santa's lap, and older brother Gavin's nearby, and of course Shelley's listening in. What is Mallory going to tell Santa? And uh, Santa says the usual, you know, little Mallory, what would you like for Christmas? And Mallory looks around, and she says, um, I want a red truck. And I want some blocks. And, oh, I want a doll with blue silky clothes. Now her mom is just flabbergasted. You know, I didn't hear about any of these things. You know, she's not noticing the display at all. She's all about her daughter. And Gavin, the older brother, of course, is hilariously laughing on the side because he sees what's happening. And so as soon as Mallory gets off Santa's lap and runs back to mom, Shelly says, Honey, I never heard you say any of those things you wanted. And she said, you know, Mom, Santa didn't have a lot to choose from this year. <laughs> Mallory wasn't sitting there saying, oh, bummer, what I wanted isn't here, you know, or what, you know, something's missing or my longings are not going to be fulfilled, she made the best of the situation. She looked around, she said, sure, why not some blocks, a red truck, a doll with some blue clothes, that sounds fun. You know? And so it's that kind of presence, you know, if we can bring that kind of innocence, really, to our lives and look around and say, wow, I've got this fabulous family. It's not always perfect, it's not always quiet, whatever it is that you're wanting. But it, it is fabulous, right? It's joyful, it's connecting, it's loving. And so if we can be in that kind of space, of, of that kind of gratitude for what is and what is present, rather than always having that chasm or that void of what is missing, what we're longing, what's not here, what needs to be fixed, what, you know? It's just like, it's so exhausting, isn't it, the way, what we do? And so it, it's instead to turn ourselves to the truth and the joy and the presence that is right here, the gratitude for what is good. And to focus on that good then increases and brings forth more of that good and more of that feeling of joy. So a lot of it is about being present. Anthony DeMello said, there's only one reason why you are not experiencing bliss at this moment. You wanna know why? It's because you are thinking or focusing on what you don't have. Yes. That's it, right? <laughs> what is here? What is good? What's good in me? What's good in my partner? What's good in you know, the people that are sitting around me? What's good about my community? What's good about my home? Focus there and watch how your life will turn to this natural state of being in joy. So that present moment, one of the, the poets of our time, she's by some heralded as the, the most popular American poet who's living, is Mary Oliver, who has that beautiful way of seeing, the, especially the natural world, in this kind of joyful, delightful way. So I'd like to share with you one of her poems. It's called Mindful. Every day I see or hear something that more or less kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. It was what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, 
to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamation. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the fearful, the dreadful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab, the daily presentations. Oh, good scholar, I say to myself, how can you help but grow wise with such teachings as these, the untrimmable light of the world, the oceans shine, the prayers that are made out of grass. The untrimmable light of the world. Let us take that into our joyful, mindful, present understanding of what is available to us. The ordinary becomes extraordinary when we are present. We don't miss things when we're present, right? That would otherwise maybe just be sloughed off or not think, thought of as much of anything. You know, the wise men in the Christmas story, they didn't miss the star. They were paying attention. They were drawn to what was going on in the sky. They were focused there. And they watched, not only did they watch and pay attention, but then they followed its movement. And they even packed up their stuff and their camels and followed its movement. So it's like spirit shows up as the untrimmable light of the world, and we go, and we follow, and we allow it to unfold, even though we may not know where it's taking us. We may not know exactly what we'll find at the end of that stream of light, but we'll go. And that's what the wise men did. Why? Because they're wise, right? <laughs> they're following the guidance. They're allowing themselves to be led. They're surrendering to the divine spirit that is leading them home. And so they follow that star. And it says, you know, I love this, that in the scripture, even though the wise men had some kind of expectant idea of goodness at the end of that star, they might not have known exactly what to expect. But the scripture says that when the star stopped over the child who was to be born, that they were overwhelmed with joy. So when we say yes, when we open ourselves to what is present for us and say yes to whatever that is, that is present, it's like opening the door of the divine and, and letting the surprises and the mystery of spirit lead us to the moment when we realize, ah, there's joy. <laughs> there's that joy. I used to think joy was elusive. I get it now. It's not. It's there. It's just... It's just about going with it, allowing it, resting in the presence, recognizing that it's here, opening the door to it by being willing. And when we do, that taproot that is joy becomes known to us, expressed through us, felt through us. So Charles Fillmore talked about how spiritual perception reveals that we are not persons, but factors in the cosmic mind. So we often think of ourselves in these sort of very simple and limited ways, right? We're a human, we're a body, we're a mind, whatever it is that we think. We've got a limited amount of blah, blah, blah. You know, you can fill in the blanks. We know that story really well. <laughs> but if we instead just take on that for a moment, that I'm not so much just a person, but I'm a, a factor, an idea, a divine idea in the cosmic mind that has become manifest out of divine intelligence. That's pretty cool to be, isn't it? I want to be a factor in the cosmic mind rather than just a person some days. All days, but you know, some days I can't even like go there. So. Today, in this moment, when we're present to it, we go with it. And, and what Charles Fillmore then says is, don't think of yourself as just a, a body of flesh and blood. He says, affirm yourself into the truth of who you are. He says, affirm, I am the Christ, born of the living God. And he says, basically, that's what Jesus did. He affirmed the truth of who he was. Christ means the anointed. And so, yes, Jesus had this 
this title put on him of the anointed Christ, but he told us and he taught us over and over again, it's not just me, folks. I'm trying to exemplify for you the truth of who you are, the hope in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Did I not say ye are not our gods? And the things I do, you will also do. You know, so over and over we were taught and shown that we too are this Christ. And that's what Christmas is all about for us in unity, is the recognition, the remembering, the rebirth of this Christed consciousness, this anointing that we have been given. So when we bind our mind with limitation, we keep ourselves in the dark. We keep ourselves blocked from that truth and blocked from our joy. Another great unity author and teacher who made his transition in 2002, Eric Butterworth, wrote in one of his books, Celebrate Yourself, when the ties that bind the mind are broken and a person is introduced to their real self who has no limitations, the bells of heaven ring for joy. It is what the essence of, of this, this thing we call God, this essence, this energy, this love, this joy, what it longs for, if there could be a longing, again, I'm sort of, it's hard not to personify, right? But, but there's, a, there's a desire, a present, a, a cosmic desire that that which was created out of that cosmic mind will remember who it is, will recognize what it is, will come home to that magnetizing truth of what it is. And so when we shift into, wow, I'm a factor in the cosmic mind. I am not just blood and flesh and bones, but I am the very embodiment, the true Christ. It's a lot to take on. So I think that's why sometimes we just need to take it sort of one step at a time, right? Some days we can go there a lot quicker than others. Some days we can really stand in our magnificence and own our joy and be in that divine flow. And other days it's just a little creakier than that, right? It's a little harder to get there. It feels a little rusty. And so that's okay if we can also be present to what is, love ourselves where we are, love each other where we are, extend generosity to one another, that lubricates the movement toward remembering the divine, the true Christed self that we are born once again to remember again at this time, to know again for ourselves. So all that stands between us, really, and this joy is those ties that bind the mind. So just... You know, I, I want to offer to you this week maybe to work with that, to journal on that or to look at that, reflect on that during your meditation time. What ties are binding my mind, if any? I mean, maybe there aren't, but chances are most of us have something that's kind of tying us up in some way or, or somehow choking a little bit of our joy out. And so just to sit with that, you know, what ties are binding my mind? Because you, we have the same power, we the ones who tied up our minds, made those binds, have the same power to just untie them. And to look and to see, ah, that's not really serving me. And so if I untie that, what could happen? Wow, all this could come forth, this clarity. The great star of Bethlehem could guide me home to the joy that I am, to the truth that I am. And so it's with those simple exercises of our work to continue to reflect back, where am I holding myself back? Where am I blocking myself? Where am I limiting? Where am I holding myself apart from others? You know, where, where am I cutting off the stream? And how can I just, and how really, a lot of times how actually really isn't the right question because how is, is the, the divine's answer? So it's more like a willingness. I'm willing to unbind myself. I'm willing to untie these binds. You know, I'm open to be shown. And then the way comes. Sometimes they even just untie themselves, it seems. You ever had that experience? We call that grace. <laughs> and always open to grace. So for us, for our joy, for this journey of joy, laugh often, laugh easily, laugh some more. <laughs> be present, be present to the good, the good that is in you, the good that is all around you, the good that is everywhere present. And allow yourself then to be your truest self. A great movie, I'll also give you a suggestion, a classic movie to rewatch is 
uh, because most of you have probably seen it, Miracle on 34th Street. Has that, have everybody seen that? It's an oldie, so some of you may not. I think there's been remakes over the years and in color and so on. But, you know, in it, Chris Kringle says he's Santa Claus, and he works at Macy's as Santa Claus, much like the Santa Claus that Mallory went to see. And then the psychiatrists start to question that he's really Santa Claus, as you can imagine, adults not believing that he really is Santa Claus. And so they then have him stand trial. <laughs> and all he can say is, this is who I am, you know? And he keeps showing up just like we know Santa to be. He's loving, he's wise, he's kind, he's jolly, he's simple. He's just Santa, right? And so there's, it's kind of the same thing for us. Like taking on the Christ, it probably won't work for you to go out in the streets and start, you know, bellowing out that you are the Christ. <laughs> you might actually be sent to the psychiatrist and stand trial in our society. We all would understand in this room, so you can do it in here if you'd like. Um, but it is that sort of allowing ourselves to be like Kris Kringle was in the movie, like he was as Santa Claus, like it, it just is who I am. You know, I, just, I am the Christ, you know? I am that. I am that which brings joy to the world. I am that because it is my natural state of being. Let's know that together because that's really the essence of joy, to know that it is our natural state of being to be in joy. And let's say it together. Joy is my natural state of being. So I invite you one more time to drop into your heart, to feel that smile in your heart, to feel the very good, very good, yay, <laughs> and then to say it. Joy is my natural state of being. And so it is. Thank you.